It's the Locked On Flyers podcast for Wednesday, July 24th, your daily dose of Flyers news, analysis, and high quality content that doesn't have to guess anymore when Matt Faye Mitchkoff is arriving because he's here. That's true. You're Locked On Flyers, your daily podcast on the Philadelphia Flyers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, and thanks for making Locked On Flyers your first listen every day. I am Rachel Donner. You can find me on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here as always with Russ Cohen, who's on all your favorite social media apps at Sportsology. We as a show are at Locked On Flyers on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and Twitter as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. You can find our show over on YouTube or on the SiriusXM app or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get our latest episode as soon as it's available here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Russ, uh, the wait is over. Matt Vay Mitchkoff is, in fact, in the United States, in Philadelphia, or in Voorhees, I guess, depending on where they're putting him up. I assume somewhere nice in Philadelphia, actually, just to get, you know. I would think so. Or nice. he's going to go to a player's house. You know, that that's Maybe. probably more likely. Uh... Maybe uh, he'll do that. Go uh, hang out with Ayer Zamula, perhaps. But... Um, It, of course, happened on Tuesday morning, arriving at the airport with Keith Jones and Danny Breer meeting him at the airport. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's, you know, putting your best foot forward. And But they have to be careful, though, because they're not going to do this with every player. So you do have to – you can't go overboard with what you're doing for Mitch Kopp because you're not going to do that with every player – and then all of a sudden, you know, there could become resentment down the line. So they got to be careful with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a fan-oriented thing more than anything. Uh, but I do think it was really cool to see him there. It was cool to see Danny Briere just be like, oh, I'll carry your sticks for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I mean, that's you know, fine. Yeah, there's more to it, I think, than just that, you know, of being nice and carrying sticks. I think... You know, this is Danny's first big swing, right, Uh as the GM of the Flyers. And I think that, you know, that pick is a load that Danny Breyer is carrying uh, for the, you know, future of this team. And so I think it was symbolic in a lot of ways, even if it wasn't intended that way. Okay. I'll I'll say okay, but I'm going to just say he's not going to do this every draft. So you have to be careful. No. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. It was just his first big move, his first big swing. So yeah. that is the load that uh, Danny Rear is carrying on his shoulders, literally and figuratively for this. Uh, Matt Vaymichkov uh, endearing himself to the fans of Philadelphia by wearing a Phillies hat as is right and proper as well. I mean, he didn't have to, but it's nice that I guess that he did. You know, there's plenty of players that wear other team stuff. now. Oh, like, sure. I wouldn't have held it against him. Let's put it that way. No, I know. I think, you know, if he had just worn one of his own hats or, you know, some random he could have worn a New York hat. Like it, 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 you know, it no, really does. Yes, no. he could have, I mean, look, there's a million players now. You go look at all the basketball players. They wear team stuff from other teams. It's a it's a normal thing. I don't think anybody would have cared. I don't. I think every day, sure. But his first arrival into Philadelphia, he either wears some generic hat that has nothing to do with, you know, picking a a sports team or he wears a Philadelphia sports hat. Those are his two options for him to wear a New York team hat coming into Philadelphia. That's what he grew up liking. I mean, it it could be the Dodgers. I mean, you're, you're overthinking it. You're overthinking it. Uh, I don't think so. I really don't. I, I grew up in Philadelphia. I know. I understand. Every city feels that way, but fans are getting less and less bothered by that. I think it was even Allen Iverson that wore a Yankees or whatever, and he wasn't hated for it. So, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's been happening since then. Yeah. I just think any other time it wouldn't have mattered, but for his first uh, appearance in the area for, for that reason, I think wearing a Phillies hat was, was good and a smart thing to do. Um, Of course we saw some 
fans getting autographs on uh, Mitch Cop jerseys already, which is really good to see. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if they were at the airport or uh, at some other location, but I mean, it looked like an airport, those. but I couldn't tell. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I think, you know, everybody is really looking forward to today's press conference that is happening at 11 a.m. in Voorhees. And we had talked about yesterday, are they going to do something at Wells Fargo? Are they going to do something at Voorhees? And, you know, I've been thinking about it since we had that conversation. And I think it is right to do it in Voorhees, to your yeah. point, about keeping things like the same for different players and they wouldn't right. you know they'd either do it by zoom or in Voorhees for anybody else so I think it does make sense for it yeah to be in Voorhees and this way it's a little more low-key and that's good he needs yeah. more low-key than big robust you know everybody going crazy stuff like that there's time for that yeah there absolutely is and so and I think it'll give him a good chance we know he's already been to the facilities in Voorhees on that secret mission right, they right. had uh, prior to the draft last year, but uh, just to, you know, show them around again, if there's been any changes, obviously with the construction there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot to talk about. Just give him, let him get comfortable a little bit there. And then uh, he'll talk to the media with a translator there. I think, you know, the questions are uh, plentiful in, you know, in terms of people knowing what, what went into the decision to come over now? And is he excited? Is he comfortable? All of that. Uh, what do you think the, the other big questions are for him? Like what else, what other training are you do? I think he should be off ice this time of year because he just got done with a tournament and you mm -hmm. don't want there to be like all of a sudden there's a tournament. Now he's got to sort of ramp up his on ice stuff and the season hasn't even begun yet. And it's going to be the longest season of his, of his career. So I think he has to do off ice stuff. I, I don't think he should do any on ice stuff for like a month. Yeah. So like, what is he doing in terms of training this off season? Yeah. What are you doing um, train, in terms of training? You know, not on the ice. What else are you doing? Are you weightlifting? Are you biking? Are you, you know, those kinds of things. And I would say, like, does he plan on uh, working out with the other Flyers players who stay in town for the offseason and getting to know them a little bit? Uh, I think that would be a good thing for him. Yeah, sure. To do yeah, I mean, well. they might do that. They might get together once a week or something to kind of goof around. That's possible. But usually those guys play golf, maybe Yeah, play golf. Right. He needs to do some of that stuff. Like you can't just throw him back out on the ice. That's my whole thing. Just don't do that. Right. And then, you know, you know, does he have um, any family coming over with him later? Good question. You know, yeah. Uh, like, what is his plan? Like, is he I don't I don't think asking him where he's going to live up front is uh, an appropriate thing to do. No, but you could just ask like asking a family's coming is a good, good question, because sometimes the moms do come early on for the cooking and aspect but if he's staying with a veteran, then it's not going to be necessary, you know, so it all depends. Right. He'll get cooking lessons from uh, Scott Lawton or something. Right. I don't know. And just imagine. But, you know, I, I assume he's going to keep that number 39, right? Yeah, I would see, I would think so. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've already so, started making them. So, I'm, you know, they're selling them at the skate zone. So I, I, I'm sure that's a guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. So. We'll, we'll get that Jersey presentation as well. Be curious if they go with the white or the orange one for the presentation, probably the orange, but probably orange. That would be yeah. my guess, but uh, we'll, we'll see there. Uh, I think, you know, any other questions in terms of, you know, what Danny Breer might have to say at this presser um, asking him about the logistics around getting him over if there was any issues with that, right? Yeah, I think I think there'll be some questions about that. Uh, you know, I think, like, if you ask Mitch Kopp how his two-way game is, he's going to say, oh, I have a good two-way game, whatever. But that's not going right, to show right. until he's actually there. So you really, to me, though, that that's going to be kind of pointless. But no, asking Danny about the that part of it, the logistics, is a good, is a good one. I'm sure he's going to get asked by, about Kolosov. Uh, there's mm -hmm. just no way around that. So that'll probably be more interesting than Mitchkoff at some point, just because that one's getting tenuous. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a big deal in the sense that 
you know, he's coming over early, but there is other stuff with him coming over early. Like he's got stuff to learn. He's not coming over yeah. ready to be the top scoring guy and player in the league. Right. And, and that's a good thing. Like yeah. you said, so uh, we are going to get to your mailbag questions later in the show, one of which is about Mitch Koff and what he's doing this summer. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, we looked into the Flyers fights this season and what it meant for the team and uh, the individual players overall. And we've got some interesting results. So we are going to get to that coming up next. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. And now we are in full swing for summer sports like baseball. We absolutely miss hockey, but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. FanDuel has odds for Major League Baseball, the Paris games with over-unders on medal counts by country, soccer, and so much more. Yeah, Randall Cunningham has a daughter, I think, that's doing the high jump. High jump or pole vault? I'm not sure. Look into that one because that's an athletic family. Uh, so head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right. On tomorrow's show, of course, we will talk about the press conference we just uh, previewed earlier in the show and what Mitch Koff had to say, what Danny Breer had to say. So stay tuned for that. Plus, we still have our weekly poll going. So uh, make sure you get your opinion heard on that. And it is, of course, uh, related to our conversation about the ones that got away. So we talked about in the poll, your favorite NHL player to come to the Flyers after they had already established an identity with another team or teams out there, uh, your favorite additions to the Flyers. So some interesting results so far. Looking forward to talking about that later in the week. In the meantime, uh, we did do some math and uh, got into the fights that the Flyers uh fought over the course of this past season. And according to Sports Handle, and we'll put a link to this in the show notes, uh, Nick Delorier was the NHL's best fighter. No shock there, 11 and 11. Uh, the Flyers won 22 of their 23 fights, according to uh, the site. And Cam Atkinson lost the one fight <laughs> that the Flyers had. So, I, you know, I, I think... They had fewer fights this past year than they did the previous year. It was like 32 or 33 right. the previous year, but uh, we're successful in all of them. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think Delorier did win all of his fights. I don't think they won as many as they have on the list. I think there were more than a few draws, uh, like the Farabee one. I kind of remember being a draw that was a back and forth. So, mm -hmm. but that's fine. I mean, in the end, I think it's more important what we're going to sort of show down the line like the effect what does the right. effect of this have on the game because that's always the big question and we're always led to believe that yeah when you do that the team gets that momentum and they just run with it so i think you know looking at the number of fights first off that the flyers had the sixth most fights in the league this past year with that 23 uh, they were actually tied with the Rangers there, uh, but the Rangers did not win nearly as many of the fights, despite having Matt Rempe in their Well, lineup. he's a rookie, though. I know. To, yeah, to he's be fair. He's training with George LaRock now, so let's see what oh he does God, this I year. I know. I know. It's so dumb. <gasps> anyway, <laughs> um, the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning uh, got into 29 fights this past season, but only won 15 of them. So just a smidge above half uh, compared to the Flyers, 96%. And, you know, only the Anaheim Ducks, who were above them in 28 fights, they won 68% of those fights. So nobody anywhere in the top 10 of teams in terms of the number of fights won nearly as many as yeah. the Flyers did, which is really interesting. I, it really is the Nick Delorier effect. There's no question. I mean, you know, that's what he's here for mostly. So makes sense. Yeah. So 
you know, now you, you kind of lay the groundwork for the number of fights and the wins and the Nick Delorier factor. How many games did the Flyers win where they had at least one fight? And the answer is seven. And so if you look at that, there were 23 fights in 22 games because there were uh, games where there were multiple fights. So the Flyers lost 15 of those games and won seven of them. Interesting. So it, it's that momentum that you're supposed to get, which I have tweeted that a lot of times you don't get it. Um, if you get it, it's temporary. And most of the time it doesn't seem to hold through. That's what statistics are showing us. I know there are some fans that will understand that. And then there'll be others that kind of like go the other way maybe and say, well, they got that temporary boost and that, that helped them do X or whatever. But it didn't help them necessarily win. I think that's the more important thing. Right. And I think that's fair. I think if you take fighting for what it is, right, there's a certain entertainment factor that people get out of seeing fights in hockey games. I personally don't love it, but if it's your thing, like, I don't, that's fine. I'm, right. I'm not going to, you know, judge that. But I think that as far as, you know, the momentum or the, the effect of it, like you were just saying, it, to me, it's a non-factor in terms of the outcome of the game. I think you can have an immediate temporary factor, like sure. within a couple of minutes of the fight. But I don't think long term in a game, it has a, a, an effect. And I think as long as people understand that, you have to, that's where you have to settle with fighting in the game. You can have fun watching it if that's your thing. and you, But you can't really expect much out of it after the fight. Yeah, the the fight part that I don't get is when a team's down five nothing and then they send somebody out to fight. Why? Right. What is that gonna do? Yeah. Is that just because we're just frustrated? Okay. But I mean, that fight doesn't do anything for me. And the staged fight at the very beginning of the game doesn't do anything for me either. If it happens organically, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. And uh, there was only really like one or two staged fights at the beginning of the game that the Flyers got into this season. And there was that whole weird thing with the Wild and Nick Delorier and Pat Maroon yeah. in one <laughs> game where they fought like two minutes into the game, which was or two seconds into the game. Like it was really, really dumb. Uh, so I think the Flyers tended to avoid that. And I think they also tended to avoid the fight for no reason at the end of the game for the most part. Well, there because now some. you get penalized for that, too. So that's right. That's definitely helped, like, towards the end end. But, like, you know, as an example, I just rewatched the Faraby fight. Like, he was sticking up. Um, Cam York got, got pulverized mm -hmm. on the sideboards. But honestly, I think both guys got one punch in and it was over. And Lin and Elias Lindholm was on top and Faraby still right. got the win. So it's like, that's what I'm saying. I don't know who's judging the fights and I can't put it in slow motion to see how many shots landed. But when you see the other guy land on top and it ends in, I don't know, 15 seconds, I'm not sure there's a win really yeah. in that one. But it's okay. He right. did it for and the right that, reasons. He did it for the right reasons. And it was immediately after a Calgary goal in that yes. game. And so there was like a lot of heightened energy because of the Calgary yes. goal and that incident. So like it made sense that that, one that it sense. happened, but it didn't like really have a net effect no. on the game overall. Um, I think, you know, the one game that was kind of a disaster and they overfought was in that terrible seven, nothing loss to Tampa where there were three fights. And even though the, the flyers won those three fights, or or they won two of the three. That was where the Atkinson fight right. was that they lost. But like nothing happened. They still lost right. the game seven to nothing. Even and if I don't you think won, it helped their dignity in that game. <laughs> right. right. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. And and that's one where yeah, I mean, I get it. If it's one of these games where you're just getting beaten to a pulp all over the place and you're really that frustrated, fine. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was like that in that Tampa game. They just were losing. They just Right. So yeah, I mean to fight three times in the game doesn't even make sense. In this era, it really doesn't. It doesn't. I would say, for me, the best, most appropriate fight of the season, uh, again, even though I don't love them, was 
in February where the Flyers were playing Winnipeg, Travis Konechny gets into a fight and then later scores a goal himself, right? Because right? it pumped himself up. It pumped up. him up, Just, and that was purposeful yeah. for that. And so that was where you could put X to Y and say, yes, mm -hmm. that makes sense, or A to B, rather. Um, it's probably better. And, and that makes sense. You know, like that other one, with Matt Rempe against Delorier, that was just, you know, Delorier saying, let's see what you can do, kid. You know, like, that's what that was. Like, and, yeah. you know, and he won the fight, sure. Um, he did take some shots, too. And they lost the game. Like, Matt Rempe, he had at least one goal in that game. Right. So it's like, okay. I mean, you, you, you showed him who is the number one honcho in the league, but you didn't win the game. Right. And there were only three instances where the Flyers scored within two minutes or so after a yeah. fight. The Konechny uh, goal was one of them. There was a goal against Ottawa um, super early in the season where that happened, but the Flyers lost that game. And there was a goal. Um, there was a sealer fight against Detroit where there was a goal that was scored um, within 30 seconds of the fight, actually, because you could hear the penalty announcements in the background as the goal was being scored. But again, Flyers lost that game. So of those three fights where there was a goal within two-ish minutes afterwards, Flyers lost two of those three games. So does it mean anything? No. <laughs> That's no, really I mean, the conclusion. And, and, it, and it probably gives me more reason to say when Delorier is not on this team anymore – you know, let Nick Sealer have his few fights a year when they're purposeful, right. when it has to. This way, teams aren't running roughshod, but you don't need Nick Deloria on the team. And Hathaway could still fight, too. And at yeah. some point, he's going to get worn down because he's going to be fighting because maybe people are going to be taking pot shots at Mitchkov, and then he's going to have to go in and fight. And it's like, you know, there's in the end, that doesn't make you a winning team. Being hard to play against and, and hitting does help make you a winning team. There's a difference yep. though. There is uh yep. Uh, Nick Sealer had four fights this season. Garnett Hathaway had three. Anyone else who had a fight just got in one. So uh, I think that's fair. If you have like three to four fights from Sealer and Hathaway over the course of a season, yeah, that's, that's a few fine. odd that's fine. A few odd fights besides that. So yep, yeah, that's that's your your fight stats for the Flyers for the season. Uh, we'll see what they do next year. To your point, especially with Mitch Cuff. In the meantime, we've got some of your mailbag questions. We're going to get to them coming up next. All right, uh, starting off with a Mitchkov question here. Jeff wants to know, does Mitchkov get on the ice in Voorhees to practice prior to camp starting? Yeah, no question, because guys always go there. Um, they start to show up about two weeks before camp and start skating around. And so, yeah, he'll be part of that crew, too. I think so. It'll just be interesting to see if there'll be some like sly video of it happening and, you know, and all of that. The Mitchkoff watch over at Voorhees with the right. youth ice hockey practice. There might going be. On. I mean, there might be, or the, the building might say, don't do it. Like it's up to them. Either way, I'd be okay. I don't think you have to show these things. Uh, so if they say, hey, listen, you know, do the kid a favor and don't, don't video anything, that'd be all right too. I mean, I'm good either way. Yeah. Uh, Andrew wants to know, are there any college free agent goalies the Flyers can sign for the Phantoms with the Kolosov situation? Well, as far as college goalies. Uh, I don't think there's any top ones per no. se. I know there were like two of them, but they both got signed already. Like one went to the Kraken and one went to the Florida organization. Yeah. If I recall correctly of like the top. 10 college free agents. I think two of them were goalies and that was the situation, but I, I don't know that there's anyone of that level that's left right now. I mean, I'm scanning a list and I really don't see anybody that's jumping out to me. You know, it's funny because because most teams now want to have three, a lot of names are gone. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think it was like um, Cooper Black was one of them, and he's the one that went to Florida, I right. think. 
So, uh, yeah, it's the, the pickings are slim right now. It's but, really slim. Probably as slim as but, it's been in years. Yeah, for the goalie market, for sure. For the goalie market, yes. So Flyer Bob uh, made a comment related to our Next in the Flyers Hall of Fame episode saying, I think you, if you have been a fan of this cursed team 50 years or more and you're not in a straitjacket, you should be in the Hall of Fame. And I know that was kind of tongue in cheek, but there's something to it about saying, let's just put Flyers fans in the Flyers Hall of Fame and make a, a, another like Flyers appreciation, Flyers fan appreciation day. I like that. I think there's something to that. Um, but I, but here, I'm going to tell a story that happened in 1993. 1993, I was working at a hotel in Philly. It was right next to the vet. Um, the Flyers fan club had a meeting, and they came out of their meeting, and or was some sort of, I don't know if it's the same Flyers fan club, but it was a group of Flyers fans, and they had a button that said 1940 forever for the Rangers. Now, me, just moving to the area, grew up a Ranger fan, I bought that button. The Rangers won the Stanley Cup the next year. I still have that button. My point <laughs> is, they were Ranger fans. Be superstitious? 19- well, be superstitious could be one thing. <laughs> but the point is, don't give up because there were Ranger fans from 1940 to 1994 that eventually got the payoff. So the payoff could be coming here for Flyers fans. That's why you don't give up for that reason, because that payoff yeah. is going to come. I always believe that things are secular and teams will eventually, you know, get good again and, and either win a cup or get to the cup. And so, yeah, I think the time could be coming and you just have to wait it out and just take your lumps. Yeah. I think we've taken a lot of lumps, but I do have some degree of hope here that there, there could be something to what this team is building. And and so I would not count this particular rebuild out. Right. Uh, right that's now. A, that's either. a key point. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we talked about the ones that got away and uh, a user over on YouTube, RTPH dot a bunch of numbers uh, said Bobrovsky won a second Vezina trophy with the Columbus Blue Jackets in 2017. And John Tortorella was head coach at the time. Should Tortorella get the credit for Bobrovsky's success? This is really aimed at you, Russ, because of your noted appreciation for John Tortorella. And the answer is no, because if you ask John how much input he has with goalies, he'll tell it's you true. none. It's That's true. the reason. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it is true. It, it He says that directly many, many times. Many times throughout the year. He has nothing to do with goaltending. Yeah. So, um, I, but I do appreciate the effort to. I do uh, too. Good job. To get Russ <laughs> on yeah, the yeah, yeah. thing. Because like he knows it. it. He knows it. And he feeds into it. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> We also had a lot of responses to our episode uh, where we basically went through my closet and talked about <laughs> the, uh, you know, our favorite and least favorite Flyers jerseys over the years. And I think the consensus was pretty similar to ours is that the 90s, you know, Legion of Doom era was the best. Uh, um, there was a lot of people that agreed with you, Russ, about the black jersey, that it was just a copycat yeah. of other teams. Yeah. Um, you know, but everybody agreed that the gold 50th anniversary jersey was just just bad. bad. <laughs> so I'm very, very grateful that everybody was on uh, the same page there and uh, appreciate everybody's responses to that episode out there. There were quite a yeah, number that's great. of them. It was fun doing that. I, I like doing yeah, that. Yeah, I did too, because I got to talk about uh, my own stuff, which yeah. is always a, a good time and i put a lot of care into collecting those jerseys yeah yeah no question ones... you have specific reasons why you had them and i have yeah. all kinds of different jerseys i have like a uh a, a sue greyhounds one because i've adopted many greyhounds like i have reasons why i have certain jerseys too you yeah know? so yeah they mean more it yeah i have more. a calgary hitman jersey from their 20th anniversary because it's fluorescent pink and i really liked it yeah yeah <laughs> so... But it's a cool jersey. It's the Calgary Hit, and the Flyers have a strong connection to the Calgary Hitmen. They do with Travis Rockford. Sanheim, right, and other yeah, players. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was for many reasons. So yeah, really good conversation. Um, we are excited to come back tomorrow to talk about what Matt Bay Mitchkoff had to say in Voorhees. We will do that then. 
as a reminder, we always want to hear from you. So get your mailbag questions in uh, via Twitter at Locked On Flyers. You can email us at LockedOnFlyers at Gmail or comment over on our YouTube channel. I'm Rachel. I'm on Twitter at R Miriam. That's R M I R I A M. I'm Russ. I'm at Sportsology, S P O R T S O L O G Y. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube that's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Have a great day, everyone.